Hi, welcome to a short lesson on the electromagnetic spectrum. Here's a preview of what we'll be talking about. First, I need to say a little bit about what it means for something to be electromagnetic, and uh, that is specifically, what is electromagnetic radiation? And note that I'll often be using the abbreviation EM in lieu of the word electromagnetic. Next, we're going to find that the radiation that we're interested in is in the form of waves. And when we talk about waves, the relevant characteristics turn out to be wavelength and phase velocity. Then we'll be ready to talk about the EM spectrum. An important part of the EM spectrum is radio, so we'll say a little bit about that. And I'll wrap up by saying a little bit about why there is contention between science, and that is in particular radio astronomy, and other uses of the EM spectrum, including wireless communications, radio navigation, and so on. Okay, so what do we mean by EM? We can break this down by first considering the static EM field. In a static EM field, we have an electric field which arises from electric charges which are fixed in space, and a magnetic field which arises from steady current. If you've taken a course in EM, you probably know these as the electrostatic and magnetostatic fields. Something that's easy to miss about the static EM field is that there's no propagation. By that I mean that if you turn off the charge, the electric field vanishes. Similarly, if you turn off the current, the magnetic field vanishes. When you turn these things off, it is as if they were never on. The term radiation refers to the ability of an EM field to transport energy, which is what we mean also by the term propagation. The mechanism for propagation is a wave, as depicted at the bottom of this slide. The way you create a wave is by varying the source of the EM field over time. Almost always, this is done by accelerating charge. For example, if you periodically change the direction of steady current, then you're accelerating charge. Maxwell's equations, which govern classical EM, tells us that when you accelerate charge, the electric and magnetic fields become coupled. That is, they no longer behave independently. Literally the time-varying electric field becomes the source of a time-varying magnetic field, and the time-varying magnetic field becomes the source of a time-varying electric field. Should you subsequently turn off the time-varying current, then the fields will persist. Furthermore, energy is transported away from the source, and then the energy that has already been shed by the source continues to move away from the source. Note that this is completely different from what happens in the static case, where the fields simply vanish when the source is turned off. Now, there's lots of ways that you can make a time-varying current. In fact, that is essentially the definition of an antenna. But let me identify a particularly important way for varying the current, and that is as a sinusoidal variation. The wave illustrated on this slide is a fair depiction of what you get when you vary the current sinusoidally. Now, a sinusoid has a frequency, and we'll call that f. Maxwell's equations describe a system which is linear and time invariant. The consequence is that a sinusoidal source having frequency f gives rise to a sinusoidal EM wave having frequency f. You really don't need to know anything else about Maxwell's equations to see this. If the system is linear and time invariant, then the response to a sinusoidal source is a sinusoidal wave at the same frequency. So, if you stand some distance away from the source and measure either the electric or magnetic fields, you would see that they vary sinusoidally with frequency f. In other words, this finding accounts for the variation in the electric field and the magnetic field at a fixed point in space. Now, let's say you observe the wave simultaneously at different distances from the source. At any instant in time, you would see that the variation with distance is also sinusoidal. Important to note here is that we are talking about the variation with distance at a fixed time, whereas before we were talking about the variation with time at a fixed distance. Now I could move the two points of observation until I see that I get the same value of the electric field or the magnetic field at both points, and the minimum such distance is what we call the wavelength. In other words, wavelength is simply the minimum distance between two points of equal phase. 
and we label this quantity with the Greek letter lambda. So when I say lambda, I mean simply wavelength. So we have this idea that the frequency of variation at a fixed point in space is the frequency f, whereas the period of the variation over space at a fixed time is lambda. Clearly, f and lambda must be somehow related. Furthermore, since f has units of 1 over seconds, that is hertz, and lambda has units of meters, the distance, it seems that whatever relates them must have units of meters per second, in other words, units of speed. We call this thing phase velocity, and we give it the label v sub p. So lambda equals v sub p divided by f, or in words, wavelength equals phase velocity divided by frequency. So, what is phase velocity? Well, it's a property of the medium in which the wave is propagating. Phase velocity is clearly an important aspect of wave propagation, so let's dive a little bit deeper on this concept. First, know that phase velocity is not really a velocity, and it's not really even a speed. Thinking of phase velocity as speed is likely to lead to mistakes. Instead, Think of phase velocity as a materials parameter that just happens to have units of meters per second. From Maxwell's equations, we find that phase velocity is 1 over the square root of the product of two other materials properties, namely epsilon and mu. Epsilon is permittivity, which you can think of as a measure of the ability of a material to store electrical energy. Mu is permeability, which you can think of as a measure of the ability of a material to store magnetic energy. We'll talk about the relevant values in just a moment. Now, I said you should think of phase velocity as a materials parameter, but I know you're thinking that also has to correspond to the speed of something. And you're right. In fact, phase velocity can be interpreted as the speed at which a point of constant phase travels. And in this sense, it can, if you're careful, be interpreted as the speed of a wave. But there's a gigantic pitfall in the concept of speed when we're talking about a wave. Namely, the speed of a wave is not necessarily the same as the speed of information that is conveyed by the wave. It turns out that the speed of information is a different quantity, and we call that group velocity. Now, this is an important distinction because there are cases in which the phase velocity can be greater than the speed of light. However, the group velocity, that is the speed of information, is never greater than the speed of light. So, if you find that confusing, just remember, phase velocity is fundamentally a materials parameter, not a speed. Now we can answer the question, what is the value of the phase velocity? In free space, phase velocity is approximately equal to 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. This constant comes up a lot, so we give it a label, namely C. Now, light is a form of EM radiation, and it also turns out that phase velocity equals group velocity in free space. So, it is common to refer to C as the speed of light. You should know that C is often rounded to the value 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. This rounding is usually okay, but every once in a while the error from rounding becomes significant. Often we are interested in the phase velocity for terrestrial propagation, that is, for EM waves propagating in air above the surface of the Earth. The phase velocity in that case is very slightly smaller than C. The difference is very, very small, so it is safe to assume that phase velocity for terrestrial propagation is C. Now, EM can propagate through materials other than free space and air. Radio, in particular, is able to propagate through many kinds of materials, which is why we are able to transmit and receive radio signals from inside buildings. The most common building materials that are not metallic, like glass, drywall, etc., the phase velocity is typically somewhere between 0.4 times C and 0.7 times C that is, somewhere between 40% and 70% of the speed of light in free space. Okay, now we have everything we need to work out some practical numbers. 
Here are two examples. In the first example, let's consider an FM broadcast radio station transmitting at F equals 90.7 megahertz. That's 90.7 times 10 to the 6th hertz. The wave from that station is traveling with a phase velocity very close to C. So the wavelength is simply C divided by F, which is 3.31 meters. In other words, the average distance between two points of constant phase along this wave is 3.31 meters. Now, light is a form of EM radiation, so we can do a comparable example for light. In example number two, we'll consider light that has the color green, which has a frequency of about 5.45 times 10 to the 14th hertz, much larger than that of the FM radio station, in fact, larger by many orders of magnitude. Now, if we let that green light propagate through free space, then the wavelength is again C divided by frequency, giving us a scant 550 nanometers. Friends, one nanometer is one billionth of a meter, so that wavelength is very, very small relative to that of the FM radio wave. Nevertheless, we see that the frequency wavelength relationship applies equally well to radio waves and light. Now we are ready to behold the EM spectrum in its full glory. The EM spectrum is simply the continuum of possible frequencies and the associated wavelengths. This chart is merely one way to depict this. At the bottom are radio frequencies, which have relatively long wavelengths. And as we move upward in the chart, we see infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, X-rays, and ultimately gamma rays. In one sense, these are all different types of EM radiation, but this chart makes it clear that the only fundamental difference between all of these different types of EM radiation is frequency, or equivalently, wavelength. Note that I've included blue arrows here to point at the locations in the EM spectrum of examples number one and two uh, that I showed in the previous slide. The table on this slide conveys essentially the same information as the figure on the previous slide, but it might be easier to get numbers from this table. Note that we tend to divide the EM spectrum into regimes, uh, which are variously known as wave bands or simply bands. The boundary between these bands is somewhat arbitrary, but the numbers shown here are the ones that are often used. Of particular interest is the radio regime, which is generally considered to cover the lowest frequencies, uh, up to about 30 gigahertz or so. The corresponding wavelengths go from many kilometers down to just one millimeter. If the frequency gets much higher or the wavelength gets much smaller, the associated radiation might be considered to be infrared. In other words, the definitions of these bands is arbitrary, so there is a range of frequencies that might be considered radio in one application, but infrared in another application. The physics doesn't really know whether you intended to say radio or you intended to say infrared. Now, since you know that there are many forms of EM radiation beyond radio, you might fairly ask why this course is focused on radio. Well, after all, from the science perspective, Every portion of the EM spectrum provides unique and valuable astrophysical information, and radio is merely one such band. From the perspective of other users of the EM spectrum, however, the situation is somewhat different. In particular, radio has many properties which make it uniquely well-suited for wireless communications. It also has one property, which I'll disclose in a moment, that makes it awful for wireless communications. The reason we run into contention between science and other users of the radio spectrum is because the radio spectrum in particular is uniquely useful for communications. Communications creates interference for other users of the radio spectrum as well as for radio astronomy, so this leads to the need to carefully manage this particular part of the EM spectrum. The same level of contention does not exist to the same extent in any higher frequency wave band. Okay, so you ask, what is it about radio that makes it so desirable for wireless communications? To answer that question, this table shows you various characteristics that we might consider. For example, in the first column, we consider, can waves travel through materials? 
This is important if we want to be able to communicate within or between buildings. Well, infrared, optical, and UV are out. X-rays and gamma rays do penetrate buildings, but we'll see that in virtually every other respect, they are not good choices for wireless communications. So that leaves only radio. Scattering is an important property for wireless communications. That's considered in the second column here. And the reason is because there must be copious scattering so that areas are not shadowed from radio waves. Well, in this case, X-rays and gamma rays are out, uh, and IR, optical, and UV are not very good. Radio, on the other hand, does more or less exactly what we need in terms of scattering in order to reach all the spots in some area that we would like to be able to cover using a wireless communication system. Now you could ask about how easy it is to receive or transmit, which is the third column. Again, this is relatively easy for radio, but relatively difficult or limited in various degrees or in various ways in the other wave bands. The fourth column considers safety. Obviously using X-rays or gamma rays to communicate raises some safety concerns. The problem is much less in the lower frequency bands and is arguably minimized in the radio band. So, all of this seems to make the choice of radio as the best band for wireless communications a no-brainer. Well, the remaining consideration, and that's the rightmost column here, is bandwidth. Specifically, how much space is available in that portion of the EM spectrum? For radio, the situation is awful. The problem is that a fixed amount of information takes up a greater fraction of the available spectrum at radio frequencies. To see this clearly, consider the following example. Let's say you'd like to simultaneously transmit 100 signals that are each 3 gigahertz wide. Well, that's easy at optical frequencies, and that's because 300 gigahertz, that's 100 signals times 3 gigahertz, is a tiny fraction of the available bandwidth in the optical band. In the radio band, however, that 300 gigahertz is essentially the entire radio frequency spectrum, and that leaves room for nothing else. So, we're left with the problem that the radio wave band is uniquely desirable from the perspective of every consideration other than bandwidth. And bandwidth, we've got a problem. Let's review. First, the EM spectrum is the continuum of frequencies from radio to gamma rays over which EM radiation is possible. This continuum of frequencies is divided into wave bands, which we assign names such as radio, optical, and so on. The way we divide and label the spectrum is arbitrary, but often useful and is usually commonly understood. An important thing you need to know in order to navigate the EM spectrum is the relationship between frequency and wavelength. You now know this to be a simple equation which depends on phase velocity, which is a materials parameter, and is usually equal to the constant C for problems dealing with EM spectrum. Finally, we've identified the unique features of the radio wave band and why it gets special attention in terms of the need to manage spectrum. That concludes this lesson. Thanks for listening.